Let's uh, open in prayer. And before we get into the opening of our prayer, I want to at least highlight for you this, that, um, I, you know, while the media's fixation is on Israel, and rightfully so, there's a lot going on there. We hear less and less about Ukraine and other things going on around the world. I found it very interesting. You remember on August 13th, I shared with you about the rise in the end days of Germany, Turkey, and Russia, especially as it plays into Ezekiel 38, 39, and in those areas. But in Daniel chapter 7, we are talking about the four beasts and the spirit of those beasts, and I talked about the rise of Germany once again. Interestingly, on Thursday this week, Defense Minister Pistorius said this, as the most populous and economically strong country at the heart of Europe, Germany must be the backbone of deterrence and collective defense in Europe, end quote. But he suggested on for the rest of the article was that Germany needed to become the defense of the unified Europe against all oppressors, i.e. Russia and other threats to Europe. It seems that history is on a broken record at times, isn't it? Even into our modern time, we just don't learn from history. And what the Bible then shows us is all of this is finally broken down by the glorious coming king who destroys the nations of men. But right before our eyes, we're seeing the building blocks, constant building blocks toward the end. And we do not be dismayed by this, but rather informed, understanding. And what we're going to read about today is a glorious hope in the midst of these struggles. And that's what we need. We need hope because when we talk about the end days, it can be something that squelches our joy, robs us of joy, and that's not the way it's to, to be. Rather, the Christian is informed, but understanding of these things, they can give the hope in Jesus Christ. And so today we're going to talk about three things that Daniel needed to hear about this hope, because at the end of Daniel chapter 11, all he hears about then from this angel that is battling against the prince of Persia is that this, there's going to be a figure likened to Antiochus IV who will be the final Antichrist of the seven-year Shemitah cycle. And that would be rather discouraging, wouldn't it, to end in that posture. He'd been burdened for Israel for 21 days, praying, fasting. The Lord then interrupts his prayer time, well, at the end of this 21-day journey that he has with the Lord. He sends this angel as a messenger. That angel then tells him the revelation that God has for us all. And in this, then he is reminded of what was to come. Things that have been already revealed, but given more detail about it. But rather than in that message, in a bleak outcome, he points him to the hope. There's a great hope even in the midst of these dark days. And we need that today as well. So we're going to hear a lot of hope today because last week was all about the summary of the book of Revelation. And some of us walked out of here just going, oh, that's a, that's a lot to take in of the heaviness of the book of Revelation. But what we can miss in the book of Revelation is how much joy there is. There's a new song being sung. There's a glorious work that God is doing on the earth and through his people, even in the midst of these things. So let's open in prayer. And then again, afterwards, we get through our study this morning, we're going to hear from our South Africa team. So I'm excited by that. Heavenly Father, thank you for the study of your word this morning. I pray that you would give me the words to speak. And to do so, it's with... Time is a limitation, I know, Lord, but I pray that you give us more time and the ability to get through this content, Lord, uh, with, uh, without the clock driving the outcome. I pray, Father, that what we hear is your word and nothing more. It's so hard, Father, because I know we all come at this with perspective. We all come at this with an eisegesis. We put our thoughts into your word and we allow that to drive it. I pray, Father, that all we hear from is you. And I pray, Lord, that you please guide the study of your word, and may we be convicted and encouraged as we go through this word. Thank you that, that Father, after all these years, 3,000 years later from the book of Daniel, we are still reading it, still learning, and still sharing, and looking up for the glorious coming of our King. We praise you for this, and we ask, Lord, you please be with Israel, strengthen the nation, may truth prevail. Father, I pray that the divisiveness of the enemy be suppressed, protect the soldiers, and I pray that this outcome uh, would come quickly and that there be no longer a, a need for further conflict, but that, Lord, you would receive all the glory even in this. We know that difficult days draw near, but I pray, Father, in the midst right now, would there be a great harvest of the salvation of souls. 
of Jew and Gentile alike. And we ask, Father, that you move mightily in that place and even in this place here today in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's go back and and read our verses for this morning. I I believe we'll get through these three. So you're welcome to look at the, uh, the verses on the screen, but it is my hope always that you have your Bible with you and you actually can get familiar with these texts. See, the, this is called a sword. I don't know if you realize that, but in Ephesians chapter 6, we're reminded to carry our sword of truth. And, and so often, it, when, you, when you learn how to use a weapon, such as a sword, or if for those of you who have ever taken any type of classes or training in that, maybe fencers or whatnot, you, you realize quite well that you can't just pick up a weapon and go right into the ring. You're going to lose badly. And, and so what happens is, is this thing ends up holding down our coffee table, and then we really don't understand it, nor do we really even know where to look. And we're very unfamiliar with the Word of God. And so my hope is, is that as you navigate some of these texts this morning, you're going to wear out these pages, and in fact, you'll know just by looking on the outside about where we're at. Right? You'll be so familiar with this, when you're engaged with other people, you'll be like, yeah, that's over here in Ephesians. Oh, let me take you to Matthew. Oh, wait, hold on. Over here in Genesis, yeah, that's what you were looking for. You know exactly where to go in the Word of God. This is what will carry you through the storms of life. So, even though it's the, the verses are up on the screen, let's just read these three verses together. You can turn with me there. I'll give you a second. I hear the pages flipping. That's good. All right, verse 1. At that time, Michael shall stand up the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. Pause there for a second. This is encapsulating the fact that we have already seen in history the Holocaust of the Jews. We see what happened there in 1937, 1942, and before and after, and all throughout history, even from the captivities in Babylon and Egypt, In other times, even under the oppression of the Ottomans, we see that this nation has been under oppression. And it has been difficult days, and this is telling us it'll be unlike anything that they've ever gone through. Such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. That's important. It's not by DNA. Remember that? Where were we at here? Matthew chapter 3 verses 9 to 10. Remember when John the Baptist was talking to these Pharisees who had come to even mock the ministry or to, as he looks at them and calls them a brood of vipers even, as the Lord would call them. These were thinking that because of their DNA that they would have privilege. And he's saying, no, no, these who are found written in the book, we'll get to that in a moment. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So you can see why in those three verses, we are just pounded with deep theological truths. Every one of those sentences require dozens of other verses to to fully unravel and unpack what is there. And that's awesome. That's what we'd expect of God's word. This is an angel of the Lord giving this revelation to Daniel. You'd expect that that's the case. He gives a sentence, but the expectation is, like the kings who were wise, they would dig and they would mine the treasures of wisdom. And it comes forth through his word. Now in this, we know we need help. We need hope. Israel needed hope. In the midst of their 70 years of captivity, we remember in Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, to give you a what? A hope and a future. Do you think we need to know that as well? We need a hope and a future, even in the midst of great difficulties. And what I want you to keep in mind here as we go through this, that we also could experience great difficulty even here in these United States. The Bible does not revolve around America. 247 kingdoms have risen and fallen, and so this nation could go the way of the dodo bird by the time that these things unfold. We don't think that that's ever possible. We have a pretty strong military. We've got some of the military's finest right here in this room. We don't ever think that adversity could come here. It's always going to hit all the other nations of the world. But the reality is, is if we prepare as Veterans, as warriors of truth, we will be so grounded and stand upon this truth that no matter what happens here, we will not be dismayed. 
we will not be discouraged because we have this hope. God is doing a glorious work. Now, Daniel, of course, as we know, he was in a state of mourning. He's overwhelmed so much so by the presence of a Christophany in the angel of the Lord. In Daniel chapter 10, the man faints twice. Sometimes as we're reading about the end times, you may get a little lightheaded. You may get to a point where you're just overwhelmed. Here he's actually talking and engaging with an angel and having seen the Lord. No wonder he's, his flesh can't handle it all. And for us, when we read about the end of days, we see in Matthew 24, 22, that unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. That's a tough one. Can you imagine even before the flood? The time of the flood, and here he's saying that unless these days would be shortened, no flesh would be saved. Not by the cause of rain from the heavens, but by the calamities and evil of men, and by the wrath of God poured out upon them. Oh boy, we can read things like that and we can lose hope. May it not be. So discussing the kingdom of the Lord in Daniel chapter 7, we go back to that study, and I'd encourage you to do so. We talked a lot about the kingdom to come. And we need to keep that hope before us of what happens during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Some of us are fairly ignorant about that because there's only about a paragraph to that time of the thousand-year reign in the book of Revelation. But the expectation is you'll find more in the book of Isaiah and Ezekiel and Zechariah and so many details about the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ. Oh, we even find out that in Isaiah chapter 65, verse 20, that there will be children still born during the millennial reign. Wait a minute. I thought it was all time of immortals. No, it's immortals with mortals. Children still born, but here's the thing. Those children, even at the age of 100, will be still considered children. And it'll be a whole different time for that thousand-year reign. Talks about the child reaching down and grabbing hold of the viper, but the viper not striking the child. Oh man, I can't wait. I've been wanting to do that for a long time. I'm afraid of snakes. I don't like snakes, I admit it. But I want to do that, and I'll have my chance, apparently. Those guys look so cool when they do that, by the way. So here, verse 1, just summarize again. He says, at that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that time. Now, as you know, and I'll get into this when we get into 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, I do believe in the blessed hope of the rapture. Now, many in this room could be pre, mid, post, or pan. Pre-tribulation rapture, mid-tribulation rapture, post-tribulation rapture, or you just think it's going to pan out no matter what. <laughs> right? So there's going to be a whole different group of folks in this room right now with various perspectives about the rapture. So my hope is that by the time we get to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about this harpazo, this thing called the rapture. And it is one of the elements of the hope within our understanding of the glorious hope, the blessed hope that is before us. And what I see is a beautiful imagery within the Galilean wedding. And, and we'll talk about what Dr. Chuck Missler has to say on that. I don't know if you're familiar with some of his writings on that. But how he looks at the Galilean wedding, it was a seven-day feast. On day number one, the bride would be taken up day number one. And she would go to be with the groom, and there would be a huge wedding party for seven days. And at that time, the bride was preserved with the groom. It was a time of intimacy. And at the finale of those seven days, then they would be presented together before the entire party. Isn't that interesting that while seven years is going on on the earth, we have this imagery of this harpazo and this time with God's people in the heavenlies. We'll talk a little bit about that as we get into our First Thessalonian study. It was often called the mercy. The book of Enoch talks a great deal about this, and that's a non-biblical text, so you have to be very careful in that with the Dead Sea Scrolls. But I'll dedicate a great deal of time to that study. It might take us a couple weeks to get through it. Titus 2 calls this the blessed hope. In Revelation chapter 3, it says that he will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world. Very encouraging texts. And so we have to make sure that we understand it rightly. In Daniel chapter 12, going back to that, we find out that there's going to be a time of trouble. Great trouble. Jeremiah chapter 30 Likens this, it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. 
It often gets worse right before it gets to be the best. It says, you know, we've often heard that, that great a cliche, perhaps, that is the darkest before the dawn. And that is true of what God is going to do in Israel and across the entirety of the world. God's not done even during the seven-year tribulation period. Praise God for that. I liken that to the thief on the cross. That even to a man in his final moments would still have an opportunity to know that Jesus Christ is king. Right there on his, literally, he's not even on a deathbed, he's on a death cross. He will never even see a deathbed. And that's, I talk about the final moments of your life. And we think about that in the final Shemitah cycle as well, that God still has a plan, even in this, for the redemption of souls. So here he gives us the very first thing that he wants Daniel to focus in on here is the hope. Number one, there's a special defender for Israel, a special defender. How would you like to know that, that you're not alone, that you have a special defender with you? Uh, You know, in 2 Kings chapter 6, you remember the story when Elisha prays and asks God that his servant's eyes be opened to see what's really going on around him. Go back and read that study, 2 Kings chapter 6. God opens the eyes of the the servant and the hilltops were covered with chariots of fire. That's an awesome display of the spiritual warfare that's actually going on around us right now. I think if we were to see it, we wouldn't be any different than Daniel, probably faint as well. Even some of the toughest in the room would probably faint at the magnitude of what the awesome display of what's really happening. Could you imagine if our eyes could see what's happening in this room right now? Because it says that the angels actually watch what God is doing in his churches. How many of the angelic hosts of heaven are in here right now? How awesome that would be to see with our eyes. But the problem is, like the Apostle John, what did he do with some of the messengers? He tried to actually worship the messenger. To which the angel says, oh no, don't do that. And I add the emphasis there. But I'm sure he was pretty emphatic. (laughs) Do not do that. (laughs) Worship the Lord only. So Michael shall stand up. That's another way of saying, arise, prepare yourself for battle. We can ask, why wasn't Michael prepared for battle before? Why at this point, at the hardest time that Israel must face, at the midway point perhaps here, the abomination of desolation, why at this point would the Lord ask or command, dare not say ask, he commands, he directs, Michael to prepare? And it's because the Lord has a chastening, even in the nation of Israel. Right now, there's only 1.9% that are considered believers there's still a chastening that happens in the land of Israel. Listen to this. This one's hard to process. Zechariah chapter 12, chapter 12, verses 2 to 3. Zechariah 12, 2 to 3 says that he will cause, he, the Lord, causes the nations to rise up against Israel. Of all the nations on the earth, 199 plus, he causes them to have conflict with Israel. We even see as one of the judgments during the bulls that demons go out to gather the men for battle, the armies of the world, to Armageddon, to the valley of Armageddon, which actually will stretch 200 miles from the Golan Heights down to a lot. He gathers them. All these demons then go out and do this gathering work, is to do battle against the Lord, to prepare and battle against the Lord. But listen, Zechariah 12, 9, then says, it shall be in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. The nation of Israel will not be destroyed. God is doing this on purpose. The Lord appoints for the archangel Michael to stand up. It says here, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. In Jude, there's only one chapter, Jude 1.9. It says that, the archangel Michael was dispatched to contend with Satan over the body of Moses. The archangel Michael wins. In Revelation 12, 7 to 9, it's the archangel Michael who's dispatched to deal with Satan again and to evict him out of the heavenlies with all of his demons. The archangel Michael wins again. So they have a special defender, a special defender. And now there's a special deliverance. Verse 1b. At that time, your people shall be delivered. Oh boy, we're looking for hope. That's a hope-filled message. You will be delivered. Promise. Israel will be delivered. 
After Jeremiah describes the time of Jacob's trouble, listen to what he says in Jeremiah 30, 10 to 11. Therefore do not fear, O my servant Jacob, says the Lord. Nor be dismayed, O Israel, for behold, I will save you from afar and your seed from the land of their captivity. Jacob shall return and have rest and be quiet, and no one shall make him afraid, for I am with you, says the Lord, to save you, though I make a full end of all nations where I have scattered you, yet I will not make a complete end of you. The Apostle Paul reiterates this in Romans chapter 11, verses 26 to 27. He says, and so all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. God has a plan. The persecution will be at its worst and then redemption is going to take place. We'll read that in Ezekiel 20. So who's going to be delivered? Just everybody who has the right DNA? Or is it something else? Everyone who is found written in the book. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. What book is he talking about? The book of life. Also called the Lamb's book of life. Four times in the book of Revelation it speaks of this. I find it so fascinating here that when we talk about the Great Commission going forth, during this difficult time unlike any other, seven years of great tribulation on the earth, three and a half years of that called the Great Philipsis, the Great Tribulation, that God is still not done with the salvation of souls. Even during that time, in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, we read that God dispatches an angel in the heavenlies that is calling on all the men, all the women of the earth to repent. Repent. So an angel is going forth across the heavens to declare this to all the inhabitants of the earth. The hard part for us to process in this is that Revelation tells us seven times that the people's heart will grow hardened and they will refuse to repent. Any of you, anybody has teenagers here? Or have had teenagers? Yeah, I see a lot of head nods. You, you know how this goes in the world of parenting. Where, why is it that when teenagers get into trouble, not like any of us were ever teenagers, we're just talking about those teenagers, right? Uh, why is it that when they get into trouble, they seem to find more trouble? And rather than turning and repenting to their parents as they ought to, they go right back into more trouble. Well, in this case, that's not, this is not just the the acts of sin, but this is now a hardened heart that is coming out here. A hardness to the things of God on display where even despite calamity, they will refuse, but not all, not all. Because the God in his mercy, the God of heaven and earth, according to Malachi, who remembers, sends two witnesses into Jerusalem. They're likened almost to an Enoch or an Elijah where they have the power not only to present the gospel in its fullness, but also to do miracles, to testify, and that at the end of their service, they will be slain in the streets. For three and a half days, they will await there and then resurrected before their eyes, ascending into heaven, followed by a massive earthquake. But they will testify right at the epicenter of Jerusalem, where the Lord himself was crucified. They will speak boldly of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the mercy of God. But they're not the only ones. There's also in Revelation chapter 7, 144,000 witnesses from each of the tribes of Israel, excluding Dan, who also go out to the nations, to the peoples, wherever they may be, to declare the message and hope of Jesus Christ. God has not forgotten. God is still doing this glorious work, even in the midst of great tribulation. And by Revelation 14, we see a huge harvest that starts to come in. Now, of the two-thirds that are slain, that leaves a third. Revelation, excuse me, Zechariah chapter 13, verse 8, tells us two-thirds of the people will be slain. That's likened to the Holocaust, but a new kind of Holocaust. Two-thirds are slain, but the third who remain. And these who see the Messiah and receive him, listen to what it says. Zechariah 12, 10. 
And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. And you see the clouds, the sky opening up and the Messiah coming down in victory and they will see him and they will mourn as the one whom they pierced. Remember when the Holy Spirit came upon Peter? And Peter was boldly declaring after Pentecost. He says, this is the one whom you crucified. And this is the one he's speaking to us, but he's also speaking to them. This is the one whom you pierced. And there'll be great mourning and sorrows to finally receive the Messiah. Amen. Oh, what a time of redemption. That is a hope that's on the horizon. And finally, we'll see the ushering in of a new and glorious kingdom of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. One kingdom under one king and one shepherd, just as Ezekiel 37 describes. Then they have a special destiny. So you've got a special defender, a special deliverance, and now a special destiny. Number three, Daniel 12, 2. And many of those who sleep, wow, look at that, we got to two verses. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. That's a tough one. Here the angel of the Lord is telling Daniel that after tribulation comes resurrection. So the Messiah had been prophesied throughout the entirety of the Old Testament. Do you know that? It wasn't something that right about the time before Jesus Christ that a few prophecies came on the scene. No, there's 355 prophecies of the first coming of Jesus. It goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. And we see that with the Proto-Evangelium or Proto-Evangelium. And, and it's a, Genesis 3 talks about the head of the serpent being crushed. Remember that? And the, the foot of this air being bruised of the line that would come out of Eve. And this was a prophecy, a declaration of the coming Messiah, right there in Genesis chapter 3. Moses would write about him in Deuteronomy chapter 18, talking about this Messiah who was to come. So this wasn't a foreign concept at all. There was going to be a Messiah, and with him would come resurrection. There would be victory over death through this Messiah. In Acts chapter 3, Peter addresses this as well as Acts 7 with Stephen, of knowing that Moses knew this. Moses knew that. Even the book of Enoch, again, an extra-biblical source of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And be careful, if you ever look that book up, there are two versions. One out of the Dead Sea and one out of Ethiopia. So we know it's the handiwork of men, not inspired text. But nonetheless, with the ancient text, you can look at this and see that in the book of Enoch, 28 times talking about the Messiah who was to come. Even the testaments of the patriarchs, more Dead Sea Scrolls. All of the patriarchs knew that the Messiah was coming. They talked about the glorious hope in the Messiah and the resurrection of the souls of men and their bodies, bodily resurrection that would come. In John chapter 11, the Lord Jesus then tells us in verses 25 to 26, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? It was also clear that Abraham understood this. Go to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 19. Describes how Abraham, when he was willing to put Isaac on the altar, was so convinced of the resurrection power of God, he was willing to put his own son on the altar. A lot of things were being revealed in that test of faith. Even Job, a Job probably predated Moses. We don't know how long, but it's probably one of the oldest texts in the Bible. In Job 19, here's what we read. Listen to these words carefully. It sounds like a psalmist. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, did not another how my heart yearns within me. 
This is what we all struggle with, right? Maybe not some as much as others, but certainly when it comes tax season or you got to see the doctor and you got an ache and pain, like the Apostle Paul who attributed this to a tent that's here today and gone tomorrow. He wanted to be with the Lord. And then he tells us, well, I have to be here for a mission, but, you know, whew, I really want to be there, right? I mean, and can you blame him? Why would we not want to be in the glorious presence with the Lord? He knew, this is Job, he knew he would be resurrected. Isaiah declared that dead men would live again, Isaiah 26, 19. Hosea declares these powerful words, Hosea 13, 14, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be your plagues. O grave, I will be your destruction. Woo! How about the psalmist of King David talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, a prophecy of his resurrection, Psalm 16, 9 to 10. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. There will be deliverance. There's hope in the midst of sorrows. Great hope. The Lord Jesus said there would be this deliverance. And we're not to be surprised at these words because it had been foretold for generations past since 1440 B.C. and even before. Enoch, who lived before the flood, testified to these things. John 5 says this, verses 28 to 29, The Lord Jesus declared, The hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear His voice and come forth. Those who have done good, to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil, to the resurrection of condemnation. What happens to the unbeliever today when they die? <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 to 9 tells us to be absent from the body is to be what? <laughs> present with the Lord. So if we're absent from the body and we're present with the Lord, when do we get our new bodies? Well, let me, let me talk, walk you through this just a little bit. And, and I expect in our few minutes that we have together on this, you're not going to be able to get the full synopsis of this. You're going to have to study this. You've got to meditate on these things. Go and study it again and again. There's this time called the first resurrection and another time called the second resurrection. Okay, so we have biblically these phrases used, first and second resurrection. In the first resurrection, there are three parts. You, know, you love how the Bible does that? talks about the day of the Lord, and it's actually over the period of seven years. It's not like the day that we think, but actually broader than that. But here we have three parts to what's called the first resurrection. First resurrection. Who had to be resurrected first? Well, Jesus Christ, right? He had to defeat death once and for all. So the very first part of the first resurrection is in the first fruits, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is a special resurrection because unlike the other miracles where we see, uh, you know, the Lord Jesus bring up many who had died, a boy and a girl, and then Lazarus. But what was the problem in those scenarios? Not only were they glorifying God, look, he brought someone who was previously dead back to life, just like Elijah and Elisha did. But in all of those resurrections, they would still die again. Do you think they were as fearful about death the second time around? <laughs> Probably not. Lazarus is like, Psst. let me tell you. Not that bad. <laughs> the wrapping's a little tight. Anyway, um, but no, they probably had no fear, but they were going to die again. When Jesus Christ, the first fruits, died and was resurrected, never to taste death again, ever, defeating death once and for all. He tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, 23, but each one in his own order, Christ, the first fruits, afterward, those who are Christ's at his coming. Okay, so we get the order there. Interestingly, the Lord brought an entourage out of the grave with him. Do you remember that in Matthew 27, verses 52 to 53? When the Lord Jesus resurrected from the grave, it says that the tombs were opened and others went into Jerusalem. It's possible that it might have been some of the prophets. Because he had talked about Jerusalem, you had killed the prophets. It's interesting because some of the tombs there along the Kidron Valley of the tombs of the prophets are empty. Is it possible that they were the prophets who were resurrected? We don't know. But then we see the resurrection, number two, 
the resurrection of the church at the rapture. Here's what he says, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. But I, don't want you to, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Oh, can you not wait now till we get to 1 Thessalonians 4? This is going to be awesome when we get to this study. But in this, I want you to understand just, just quickly, think about this for a moment. How many trumpets are there in the Bible? There's a, well, okay, we, not how many times the trumpet's blown, but there's at least two different types of trumpets. There's the shofar. We've blown the shofar in this room. But there's another one in Numbers chapter 10 called the salt pinks, silver trumpets like a bugle. The bugle call moved the camps of God. The shofar was a declaration of judgment or a time of call to prayer or holiness or the movement of the Ark of the Covenant. Different types of sounds. And so we have to be mindful in the English it says trumpet a lot. But we have to actually understand that there might be different kinds of trumpets depending on the situation. And so we'll study some of that as we get into 1 Thessalonians 4 as well. Bottom line is the saints will be gathered for the wedding feast of the Lamb in Revelation 19. Then we're assembled in heaven, Matthew 24, 31, assembled in heaven to do what? To come back with the Lord, Revelation 19, 14, on white horses. <laughs> it's so cool. I can't wait. Then the third, the third aspect of, the rev- of this resurrection period is the resurrection of the Old Testament saints with the tribulation saints. Okay, listen to this. Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 to 6. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection over such an The second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Everyone whose name was written in the Lamb's book of life will be resurrected to new bodies. To new bodies. Do you understand that? We're not talking about like a, some sort of a, you know, ghost or some bodiless spirit here. We're talking about bodies. You receive a new body, but the old body has to go and you're given a new body. In fact, in Revelation chapter 22, he tells us that there's going to be the tree of life at the center of the new Jerusalem that bears fruit in all seasons. Well, what do you do with fruit? Wow, that's really nice. Oh, you're going to pick it. You're going to eat it. So in this body, you'll actually consume the fruit of the tree of life forever and ever. Right? I mean, what an image of the intimacy. Who is the tree of life? Jesus Christ. Right, so it was at the garden was presented Christ or the law. Which one do you rather be under? Right? So mankind and the Adam and Eve, they pick of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And now they're under the condemnation of the law. But forever and ever we're going to eat of the tree of life. Under Jesus Christ our Lord. It's an awesome display. Let me, okay, in our, I know we're going to get some time here. We've got to hear from South Africa. 1 Corinthians 15. Let me read this one to you. You've got it. You should be having it up on the screens. It wasn't in your sermon notes, but it's important that you hear these words. Those of you who understand planting seeds, an agrarian culture, any gardening experts here? Anybody uh, plant gardens? I know we got a few. We got a few gardeners. You understand these, this vivid imagery then of planting a seed, okay? Here's what he says in describing our new body. 
1 Corinthians 15, 35 to 49. But someone will say, how are the dead raised up? Okay, let me pause there for a sec. Everybody kept thinking that it started to grow in, in this unfortunate popularity that because of the Sanhedrin that had Pharisees and Sadducees, it was the Sadducees who didn't believe in a resurrection. And that started to filter in through all of the groups. There would be no resurrection. So you got to live your best life now. Go buy Joel Osteen's book. There it is. Right? It's all about right now. There's nothing else. It's all about today. Right? And so that's why they were sad, you see? Because there was no resurrection as far as they, they understood. So they were sad, you see? So they didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. So here we go. So, but someone will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he pleases, and to each seed its own body. Okay, so you've got something that's growing. It produces seeds. The thing that produces the seeds dies, and now the seed goes into the ground, and it produces something else. It's similar but different. It's not going to be identical, but it's going to be different. Something dies, something new comes up, right? He says, all flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of animals, another of fish, and another of birds. Makes perfect sense. There are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, and from where one star differs from another star in glory. Some are brighter than others. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption, and it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor and raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body. There is a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spirit is not first. The spiritual is not first, but the natural. And afterward, the spiritual the first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we also bear the image of the heavenly man. The old goes away and the new comes. Oh, and wait till you hear what the new one looks like. Because we are already told that you will soar with wings like eagles, but don't think for a moment you earn your wings. Okay, that, that's, that's a wrong interpretation of that text. People tell me, oh, I become an angel when I die. Eh. You judge angels. You sit on the throne with Jesus Christ. You sit in a position of authority over angels. No wonder they were so jealous and followed Satan to the earth. A third, two-thirds, not so much. They followed Jesus Christ. And they're here to serve and aid you, and they're right here in this room, I believe it. And, and so you don't become an angel. You become the bride of Christ. You have a position of authority that you didn't earn, that Christ gives you, and gives you a throne and a position of authority even over cities during the millennial reign. None of us earned that. It is given to us through our King of glory who bestows upon us a treasure that you can never earn. But you can labor in the vessel that you have to his glory. But when you receive your new vessel, there will be work to be done in the millennial kingdom and beyond in that new vessel that the Lord has given to you. But then there's the next called the second resurrection. Listen to this, Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 to 15. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the earth fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works. But the things which were written in the books, by the things which were written in the books, the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. 
Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You see, during this time, there will be mortals who will be born on the earth during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. And so they also will face the tempter. See, the angels in heaven had to face the tempter. You and I face the tempter every day. And we have to make a decision to follow Jesus Christ in total allegiance to our heart. Those born under the reign of Jesus Christ in the millennial reign, those children born in that also will end up facing the tempter. In Revelation, we read in chapter 20, verses 7 to 10, of a great rebellion that ensues. It tells us that they will number the sands of the sea that turn on Jesus Christ. That's the hardness of the hearts of men on full display. You have a perfect world in which you dwell outside of the decisions of men, because men will still sin. They're not given to the tempter. It's just the nature of their hearts. So those born in the flesh on earth during the millennial reign still have, it's interesting because the Levites are assigned to judgment seats. They've got to make judgments over the affairs of men. If they can't come to a conclusion, Jesus Christ is a Supreme Court judge who makes the final decisions. That tells you there's disputes. So there's all these things going on on the earth during the millennial reign of Christ, but those born also face the tempter and masses turn on Jesus Christ. Can you imagine? We see it even today. And even then, they will have to face the tempter, and many will follow his deceits. They also must go before the great white throne judgment. Many will go to life, but there will be those under this rebellion who go unto death. And brothers and sisters, that's the key issue that when you leave here today, it is quite clear. It's a black and white issue. There is a narrow way that leads to life. There is a wide way that leads to destruction. He gave us that choice, Matthew chapter 7. What will you do? What life will you choose? Because this vessel is going to go away. It's very, very temporary. I mean, I can't imagine just for you, how, the journey of your life. I look back at the last 20 years, and I go, my goodness, look, how, it's like a, a vapor. It's just, it was here today and just gone tomorrow. I feel like I just graduated high school yesterday sometimes. I kind of act like it sometimes, too. I understand that. But the reality is it was like that. It's like a vapor. You imagine just how fast it's going to go, so you've got to make a decision today. Jesus tells us in John 14, 6, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through him. Amen. This is the decision time in verse 3. I'll wrap it up with this. It's an awesome verse. They all are. They're all awesome verses. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Don't you love how he tells us in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 to 16, that you are the light of the world? Does your body glow at night when you turn out the lights? <laughs> if it does, you call me right away, okay? Because there's probably something you're eating you shouldn't be eating. But in this case, think about that. You have been called the light of the world. So what you preach, what you do, how you live bears the light of God's glory. And John and 1 John, he tells us that he is light. He's the light. It's not your light. You're radiating the glory of God in this world. But here, we get a quite literal sense. It's a simile. Like the firmament, you also are going to radiate his light. <laughs> what? So Ezekiel 28, we're told the body that Satan once had as a cherubim in the glories of God. And it reflected his glory. It was beautiful. And he forfeited all of that for his own pride. Today, we also find the path is quite clear. One to life, one to death, and your pride will get in the way. Satan forfeited all of that glory for nothing. And it only leads him, according to Isaiah 14, to the pit of the bottomless pit of hell itself. Which path will you choose? Because the Lord tells us here that quite literally, your new body is going to reflect his glory forever and ever. It's not just going to be your character and your spirit doing the things of God, but now your very body will reflect his glory forever and ever. How awesome is that? No wonder we have hope in the midst of struggles. In the midst of the chaos of this world, we don't put our eyes on the stormy seas. 
We put our eyes on the one who walks on the stormy seas. The one who calms the stormy seas. And he will deliver. He has a plan for Israel. He has a plan for his church. And that comprises Jew and Gentile alike. But think about this. Seven times Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were informed that their descendants would number the stars of heaven. If you go back through the annals of history and look up the numbers of the tribes of Israel, you might be hard-pressed to find all of the numbers of the stars of heaven. But Ephesians chapter 1 and Galatians chapter 3 tell us we're adopted in. Can you imagine the whole adopted family of God now in Revelation 7 says it's a number that can't be counted. All glowing the presence of God back to himself in joyous celebration forever and ever. Man, I can't wait. Brothers and sisters, this would give us great hope in the midst of whatever fears, whatever sorrows you're going through. You know the instruction of Philippians chapter 4. You take all those burdens to the Lord. And he will give you a peace that surpasses understanding. Even for your family members who don't know the Lord yet, just like the thief on the cross, until they breathe their last, there is still hope. Don't stop praying. Don't stop fasting. Don't stop giving the message because there is still hope. There is still hope. Even today, for someone in this room, wherever you may be or watching online, the message is clear. The hope is in Jesus Christ our Lord. And he will deliver. As we close in prayer, we're going to sing. And then Sammy is going to introduce, after a long delay, Miss Maggie Moonsami and her team from South Africa. So for those of you who have to get your kids, feel free to do so. But please come right back in, listen, and, and get excited about what God is doing there in South Africa and around the nations of the world. Join us as we're going to pray for her Come around her, pray over her and her whole team, and then you're going to do a meet and greet right next door, okay? Can we do that? All right, she's come a long way to be with all of you, so don't, don't run off yet. She's got some things to share. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the joy to be able to gather with the saints in this room and to read your word, study your word, and be excited by your word. Father, your promises are true. You've never missed a one. Every promise, you will see them through to full completion. May we be patient. When the storm seems so overwhelming and the mountains seem so high, may we be reminded that every mountain will crumble before you. May we be reminded that all the seas will dissipate before you. You are the authority over all things, even our next breath. And you have called us your own. You know the number of the hairs on our head. And you have given us a glorious look into the future of the hope that is before us. May we keep our eyes on the author and perfecter of our faith. We praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. As we sing this last song, I want you to feel free to stand, to sit, but just to meditate on who God is and that he is worthy to be praised.
Son, God, so that we can be with you for all of eternity. Lord, we do not deserve anything, God, but because you love us and you seek after us and you do not let even one go, God, you've given us life everlasting. And God, I just pray that we would be able to utilize that light and that love that comes from you and that we would shine that bright in every moment and every day, God captivate us with your love so that we can glorify your name because you are worthy to be praised God and it is in your holy and precious name that we pray amen